Hey everyone, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and this is a tutorial for functional programming in Kotlin. Specifically, we're going to talk about functional error handling, nullable types, and option types without necessarily dealing with the cause of errors, which is going to be a subject for a future video. This is a tutorial that will show you how to do error handling in Kotlin in a functional way. So this assumes some basics of the Kotlin language, obviously, and some functional programming principles, which I'm also going to glance over while we are doing the code examples. Now, as always, the recommendations are just write code with me just to make the best out of this video. And whenever you need to refresh your memory, just refer back to this video or go to the written form at the blog with the link in the description, courtesy of my old student and friend, Ricardo Cardin. All right. Now, without further ado, here I am in IntelliJ IDEA with a simple object with a main method because we're going to test some stuff. The kind of stuff that we're going to use in this tutorial is going to be the arrow functional library. So io arrow dash kt with arrow core. This is the only library that we need. And the Kotlin version that we need for this tutorial is 1820 at the time of recording. You can find the Palm XML in its full form at the blog. So you might want to keep that handy. Now, first, we need to understand what's wrong with the traditional approach to error handling so that we can explain the functional approach to error handling. And um, to that end, imagine we want to create an application that manages a jobs board. So I will define a simplified model of a job. So I'm going to define a data class. I'm going to call this job. And I'm going to have a val ID, which is its own data type. I'm going to call this job ID. I'm going to have a val company, which is a company. I'm going to define the data structure shortly. Val role, which is a role. And val salary, which is a salary. All of these are simple value classes that I'm going to create shortly. So I'm going to create a value class. I'm going to call this job ID, which simply wraps a val value, which is a long. Now, value classes are not really supported at the moment. So I'm going to add the annotation at uh, JVM uh, inline. And uh, this will allow the value class. And then I'm going to create a bunch of other value classes, again, with the JVM inline. So I'm going to define the company role and salary as we need them for the job data structure. So I'm going to have a value class company. And the value is going to be a, a string in this case. So this is going to be a string, then we have the role, role, again, this is going to be a string. And then we are going to have the salary. And the value is going to be a double. So we are going to define this as money. Now, side note, never use double for money. If you're managing people's money, never ever use the regular float or double data types. Now, these things are, I'm actually going to call them name. So company has a name and role has a name. The job ID and the salary will simply have values. Okay, now the value class salary, I'm going to have a extension method, I'm going to have an operator there. So I'm going to have operator fun, I'm going to call this compare to other salary, and I'm going to return an int. And I'm using the operator keyword so that we uh, can use this infix, I'm going to have value dot compare to uh, the other other dot value. So that we can simply compare salaries directly. Okay, now I'm going to simulate a so called database database as a an in memory map, but this can obviously be a real database if you want to take this up a notch. So I'm going to have my uh, jobs uh, database database. And this is going to be a map of job ID and job. And I'm going to have map of and I'm going to create some associations, so I'm going to have job ID one to a job and I'm going to have job ID one. And then we have company, I'm going to call this, let's say Apple, one of the big companies out there, and I'm going to have a role with, uh, let's say, uh, data engineer, and uh, a salary of let's say $100,000. All right, and I'm going to do the double O here because we're using doubles. And I'm going to duplicate this a bit. So I'm going to have job ID one, and then I'm going to have a job ID two, and then job ID three, let's say job ID two, I'm going to have, let's say, job ID two with uh, another big company like Microsoft, and then I'm going to use uh, software engineer, 
let's say the same salary or let's just add another dollar there and uh, job ID three and job ID three. I'm going to call this Google and I'm going to use uh, site reliability engineer and I'm going to uh, add another dollar or so. Okay, so these jobs are pretty much equal from the point of view of whoever's looking at them, but they are obviously data, different data structures. Okay, now I'm going to create a dedicated module to retrieve such job information. So I'm going to have a service interface like interface jobs, and uh, I'm going to have a function there. I'm going to have, let's say, find by ID, where the ID is a job ID, and this is going to be a job. Now, when you call find by ID, if this ID doesn't exist, then what do you do? You normally throw an exception. So throw an exception if the input is invalid or something like that. And I'm going to create a class, let's call this naive jobs, which extends jobs. And uh, I'm going to have my override find by ID. And then I'm going to say, val, let's call this maybe job which is a job question mark. So this is a nullable type. And I'm going to return uh, jobs database apply to that particular ID. Okay, now, if this maybe job uh, is not equal to null, then I'm going to return that job. So I'm going to say return maybe job. Otherwise, I'm going to throw an exception. So throw new no such uh, element without the new I've gotten used to uh, Scala. So no such element element uh, exception with uh, job not found or something. So this is a pretty trivial implementation, but the interface is very important here because we guarantee the fact that we're going to get a job. But if the job is null by finding by trying to find it in the database, then we have no choice but to throw an exception. Now we can actually use this in a program. So I'm going to define a class, let's call this jobs, uh, job service with a private val uh, jobs interface. I'm going to say jobs jobs. And I'm going to have a function, let's say retrieve salary with ID job ID. And this is going to return a double, let's say. And I'm going to try to find the job by this particular ID. So I'm going to say val job as jobs find by ID ID. And then I'm going to return return try and I'm going to have uh, job salary value and that is going to be the double that I care about and I'm going to have a catch for uh, any sort of exception and if I get an exception I'm going to return zero so zero dot zero so notice that because we're expecting some exceptions we have no choice but to resort to this defensive style of writing code now let's try to test that in main so here under main I'm going to define my jobs interface and my valid jobs as jobs as live jobs or whatever naive jobs the way that I constructed that and I'm going to have my jobs service sir this as jobs service with jobs and then I'm going to have my job ID which is a long and that's going to be let's say 42 which obviously doesn't exist in the map I'm going to have my salary salary as jobs service retrieve salary on a job ID under this number 42 or with a uh, job ID the variable that I've created earlier and I'm going to say print line salary of the job and I'm going to inject job ID is salary now, needless to say, this thing will crash. Let's try it out, and uh, we're going to see an exception. So notice that we have job not found. So it's not this, the fact that we have job salary value under try catch, but that the find by ID throws an exception. So the traditional way of catching or handling errors would be to wrap all potentially dangerous code in try catches. Now, I'm going to talk about the functional way of doing that. So one of the main principles of functional programming is something that's called referential transparency. So referential transparency. Now, referential transparency is a principle that states that a function should always return the same result when it's called with the same arguments. And the expression that invokes that function should always be able to be replaced with the expression that that thing is evaluated to without changing the behavior of the program. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let me create a jobs service, let's say version two, 
And this retrieve salary is implemented in the following way. This jobs find by ID on that particular ID, which obviously doesn't exist in the database, should be replaced by the expression that this thing is evaluated to, which is, in our case, a throw no such element exception. So it says job not found. So instead of jobs find by ID, we have throw no such element exception, job not found. Now notice that the compiler tells us the fact that we have unreachable code because this thing will interrupt the flow of the program. Now, if exceptions were referentially transparent, then I would be free to move this expression around such that the order of evaluation stays the same. For example, I would be able to say val job equal throw no such element exception, or vice versa, I would be able to run jobs find by ID inside and the behavior of the program should not change. But if we run the program again and use this new instance, jobs service2, we find that the behavior of the program does change. Therefore, a function like this, which may throw exceptions, is not referentially transparent because it may or may not change the behavior of the program. This principle is something that I emphasize a lot in my Scala courses, and this is a principle that we're also going to see a lot in this video. So. Any function that can throw exceptions is not referentially transparent. That's the conclusion. So functions that throw ex uh, exceptions are not referentially transparent. In other words, function calls that may throw exceptions cannot be replaced with the expressions that they evaluate to because they can change the behavior of the program. Now, we also want the compiler, so we want the compiler to catch or rather warn us of potential errors, which in our case we cannot really do because the no such element exception is something that is caught at runtime. This is a runtime exception. Now on the JVM we have the so-called checked exceptions, which can or should be declared in the signatures of functions, but that is in antithesis with functional programming. So checked exceptions don't work well with uh, functional programming. And one reason that checked exceptions don't work well with functional programming is because of higher order functions. Higher order functions take functions as arguments or return other functions as results. What happens if those functions throw exceptions? You'd have to declare them in the function signature somehow, but that does not genericize well at all. For example, the map function. What if we have the list, uh, let's say one, two, three, map, and we say uh, x arrow x plus one or something like that. This isn't like pseudo uh, Kotlin. This is actually uh, a Scala kind of syntax. What if this function threw exceptions and we still wanted the compiler to warn us of potential errors or even worse, not compile our code if we didn't catch exceptions? That sort of compiler is close to impossible to create because these are fundamentally at odds with each other. A functional programming library like Zeo in Scala attempts to fix some of these problems, but it doesn't fix all of them, just as a reference. So in functional programming, if we want to deal with errors, we have to think differently. Now, one thing that we can do is use nullable types. And nullable types in Kotlin are very useful because the compiler can catch the possibility of a variable that can have potentially the null value. So I'm going to modify my jobs interface at the very top, so interface jobs, I'm going to return job with a question mark. Question mark means that this thing may be null. So question mark means that this value may be null. Now, in this case, we can implement another kind of class. So I'm going to call this class live jobs, which extends jobs. And I'm going to override find by ID. And I'm simply going to do jobs database on ID. Now, jobs database on ID is going to return something that may be null. So uh, if jobs database on ID crashes with some sort of exception, I'm going to return null. So I'm going to have uh, equals, I'm going to do a try, and I'm going to say jobs database ID catch. And uh, in case we have any sort of exception, E exception, I'm simply going to return null. So this is a nullable type. Now, this live jobs can be passed as argument to a potential job service. Now, my job service, which I'm going to um, kind of remove here so that I can keep my code clean, my retrieve salary function is simply going to say jobs find by ID ID and then salary value. So I'm simply going to say uh, equals here and I'm going to say jobs find by ID ID dot salary value. 
and that's it. I'm going to remove the rest of my code. Now, in this case, notice that we have a compiling error on the dot here because jobs find by ID ID is something that can be null. So the compiler warns us against the fact that this expression may return a null. And so in order to fix that, we're going to use the question mark dot. So question mark dot says, if this jobs find by ID ID is not null, then get its salary. Otherwise just return null for this entire expression. Now notice that the compiling error has now propagated to the rest of the field. So I'm going to have a question mark on this one as well. So question mark dot value. And so I will have to, uh, in order to return a definitive double instead of returning null, I'm going to say question mark colon 0.0, .0 to provide a default value in case the left hand side of this question mark colon operator is null. So if this whole expression is null, then I'm going to return 0.0. .0. Now for those of you who have been doing Kotlin for a while, you may be wondering, Hey, Daniel, what, what do you want to say with this? We've been doing Kotlin for a while. We know what question mark dot is. We know what question mark colon is. What is so functional about it? Well, these operators and nullable types allow us to process potentially null values in a functional type similar to the option type. You may be um, familiar with this data type from Scala or other uh, tools. So the question mark and the nullable types allow us to use a functional construct called lit. So let will allow us to run a function on a nullable type and allow us to process it regardless of whether it's null or, or not. Let me give an example of how this let function would work. So I'm going to have a class. I'm going to call this uh, currency converter. And uh, I'm going to display the salary of a job in a particular currency. And because I live in Europe, I'm going to have a function called uh, convert USD uh, to euros. So I'm going to simply say uh, USD to euros, amount double, which you should never use for money. I'm going to return a double, which you should again, never use for money. And I'm going to say amount times 0.91, which is the currency exchange roughly at the time of recording. Okay, now this currency conversion will convert the salary of a potentially null job. So here's what I'm going to do. In my jobs service here in retrieve salary, I'm going to have another function. Let's say retrieve salary, and I'm going to have a euro suffix to that. And I'm going to have my ID, which is a job ID. And this is going to return a double. Okay. Now, how do we do that? Well, we're going to have jobs find by ID, ID. And then I'm going to say question mark dot let. So question mark dot let will allow us to run a code block or a lambda. So we have a lambda, which has the uh, it, which is a job that we're going to process here, the argument to this lambda. And I'm going to have converter, which is a an instance of converter that we can apply to the job service. I'm going to have my uh, private val converter, which is a converter which is a currency converter. That's how I called it. And I'm going to have my converter dot uh, USD to euros. And we have it dot salary dot value because we know for a fact that at this point, the job is not null. Now, converter USD to euros ID salary, uh, it's salary value. And this is a nullable double. And in order to return a definitive double, I'm going to use the Elvis operator again and return to 0, 0.0 in case we have... Uh, a null on the previous expression. So this is very similar to the option type in Scala, for instance. So we have an option, which is jobs find by ID, which is an ID, and then we have a map. So the equivalent of let in Kotlin is a map function on optionals. And for it, which is a job, you can name it anywhere, any way you want. It's called it in Kotlin, but you can call this J for instance, and I'm going to return a con a converter, converter USD to Euro, and I'm going to have J salary value. And then with this Elvis operator, I'm going to say simply get or else 0, 0.0. So notice that this chain here is the Scala equivalent or the very functional equivalent to the let function. So the let function allows us to do an equivalent of functional programming on nullable types, and this is embedded in the Kotlin standard library. And you can also embed other functional constructs on nullable types. For example, I can define a function called uh, is from company, and I'm going to have my ID, which is a job ID, and a company, 
company is a string, and uh, this returns a Boolean. And I'm going to have jobs find by ID on ID. And I'm going to say question dot, and I'm going to use take if. And take if is another lambda, and I'm going to have uh, it company name is equal to company. Obviously, this is a nullable Boolean, so I'm going to have not equal null to return true or false, whether we can return a valid company in this case. So take if is another functional construct that you can use on nullable types, and this deals with errors automatically. So notice that we can have the happy path, that's what we care about as programmers, and not deal with the errors instead. Now the way let and take if are implemented is actually quite fascinating. It's based on contracts. So take if is uh, a contract which is uh, essentially exposing a very limited compiler API that allows to see whether that lambda has been invoked or has returned or has been invoked exactly once or things of that sort. And if so, we will return a value or a different value. I may talk about contracts another time. Now, we wrote quite a bit of code. Let's try things out. Let's see if our code still works. So I'm going to have my job service. I'm going to create my uh, currency currency uh, converter as a currency converter, currency converter. And I'm going to pass this currency converter as the second argument. I'm going to have my job ID. And uh, I'm going to have my, um, let's say, ID number one. And we have the salary, and I'm going to have, let's say, is Apple job as jobs service is from company. I'm going to have job ID, job ID, and then I'm going to have Apple. Let's say, so this is the name of the company, if I remember correctly, Apple. Okay, so job service is from company, job ID one is Apple, and I'm going to say print line, uh, job ID, job ID is from Apple and uh, I'm going to inject an if expression if is Apple job I'm going to return uh, the empty string else I'm going to inject a big not in here so I'm going to say is and then a space and I'm gonna add a space not if uh, this thing is not from Apple so let me go rerun this program and we're going to say uh, job ID is going to be from Apple because that's how we wrote in the database. All right, so we have job ID one is from Apple as expected. Now, we have the question mark dot and then we have some functional constructs on our nullable types so that we can deal with errors automatically or rather let the runtime deal with that. Now, because we have this question mark dot operators, it's very easy to nest them if we have composite conditions, which will make the code a little bit unwieldy. Let me give an example. So I'm going to have a function. Let's call this sum salaries. I'm going to have job ID one, which is a job ID. Uh, and then I'm going to have job ID two, which is a job ID. And this is going to return a nullable double. Okay, now I'm going to put this function in my job service because that's where I want all my functions to stay. So I'm going to simply sum all the salaries from job ID one and job ID two. Naturally, we need to find them in the database. So I'm going to have, let's call this maybe job one, which is a job question mark as uh, jobs find by ID uh, job ID one and similarly for job ID number two so we have two potentially null jobs okay now we need to test both of these against nulls so I'm going to say return I'm going to have maybe job one dot question dot let and I'm going to have job one Gonna have a lambda to rename this argument and maybe job two question mark let and then question mark dot let and gonna have my job two and then I'm going to sum both of these together so I'm gonna say job one salary value value plus job two salary value so I'm going to sum these together notice that we have to question mark dot let and this will indent or nest for as many nullable values I may have. So if I have five, I'm going to have a nested expression of five different question mark dot let. This 
becomes unwieldy. Now, obviously, there are better ways to do that, and for that, we will use the arrow library for nullable types. And there is a namespace called nullable, and we can use the eager function to compose potentially uh, multiple nullable values together in one direct style. Let me show you how we can do that. So I'm going to have my functional function, uh, some salaries, I'm going to call this um, some salaries version 2. Again, with job ID 1, job ID 2, this is going to return a nullable double. Okay, now I'm going to use nullable, and nullable is something from error.core. I'm going to import that. So nullable dot, and there is something called eager, which is a scope. And nullable eager will allow us to run multiple nullable values and then return one nullable value at the very end. Let me add some logs. So I'm going to have, let's say, searching for job and I'm going to use uh, job ID one. And I'm gonna have my job one as a job. So I'm only dealing with a happy path and the null position will be treated automatically by nullable.eager. So I'm going to use jobs find by ID, job ID one. And in order for me to validate this with a compiler that this is the happy path, I'm going to use an extension function called bind, which works with this nullable eager. Okay, now I'm going to do the same. So I'm going to say print line um, searching, searching for job, job ID two. And uh, I'm going to run another print line to just validate the fact that I've found job ID one. So uh, job one found, and I'm going to use job one and I'm going to inject it inside. Likely, likewise, I'm going to use uh, job number two, and I'm going. I can use the bind again, or you can use a function called ensure not null. So ensure not null. Job ID number two, and after that, I'm going to run another print line. I'm going to say job number two found. Job number two, and then I'm going to return my desired value, which is job one salary value plus job two salary value and job number two needs to be the second variable here. So notice that I can just deal with a happy path and whatever nullable options I may have in the scope, nullable.eager is going to return null for the entire expression. And both bind and ensure not null are uh, functions that are based on contracts. Contracts are extremely powerful APIs that we might deal with at a later time in another video or maybe who knows in a Kotlin course. Now, obviously, nullable.eager is going to stop the evaluation of expressions as soon as it finds a null. For example, if job1 doesn't exist, then the rest of the stuff is not going to be evaluated. Let me show an example for that. So we have some salaries version 2. I'm going to say print line um, sum of salaries of jobs, and I'm going to run an expression here. So I'm going to have a val, let's say, some salaries as... Uh, jobs service dot some salaries job ID one I'm gonna have a job ID with one and job ID of 42 let's say and we have some salaries of jobs I'm going to simply invoke uh, some salaries in site now if I compile and run this code obviously I'm going to return zero or null Ouch, we have an exception because I'm using the naive jobs instead of the live jobs. So I should pass the right implementation of live jobs here because it will simply return null in case of exceptions. So I have live jobs inside, then I'm going to use that one instead just to deal with nulls. Let's see. So at this point, we should be getting a null for some salaries. Obviously, you can also run a default value if this final expression returns null. Now, I made another mistake here because I'm using some salaries version 2 instead, and I'm also going to use a 0, 0.0 in case this thing is null, just so that you can see the logs. So let me compile and run this again. So notice the logs we have searching for job ID 1, job ID 1 found, searching for job ID value 42, and the rest of the stuff was not evaluated after job number two was null. So after this thing was found to be null, then the rest of the stuff was not evaluated and the whole thing just returned null. Now, in the blog post, Ricardo gives an awesome explanation for how these things work behind the scenes. So I'm not going to stress these too much. You can find all the details in the blog post if you're interested. Now, 
one last thing I wanted to show you before we wrap up this video is options. So an option is a standalone data type that has functional constructs. So for example, let me go up to the top, up to my interface here, and I'm going to define another function. I'm gonna call this find by ID option with ID, which is a job ID. And instead of a nullable job, I'm going to use an option job. Now this option needs to be imported and I'm going to import the entire arrow core package and arrow core continuations because I'm going to use some of the scopes and options just to demonstrate some points. Now, this class naive jobs, I'm actually going to comment out or simply remove because we already proved our points. And I'm going to override find by ID opt and I'm going to run the same kind of try. So I'm going to say try. And I'm going to use the same kind of construct, jobs database ID. So I'm going to say job database ID and I'm going to use an extension method from error. So I'm going to say to option. And I'm going to catch an exception, E exception of type exception and I'm going to return not null but none the construct of option that simply returns an empty instance okay now with the options you can do a bunch of stuff because this is a data structure that you can process in a functional way with methods like flat map and map and you may know those from Scala for those of you who have some Scala experience so here in my job service I'm going to run a little example here and I'm going to write a function that um, tries to find a job ID and tries to calculate the difference in salary between that job and the maximum of the entire database. So I'm going to run a function called uh, salary uh, gap versus max and I'm going to have my job ID as job ID and this is going to be an option double in this case and I'm going to have my val maybe job as option job as jobs find by ID opt with that job ID. Now I'm going to have my maybe max salary as and in this case I need to run a function that returns all the jobs. So in my jobs interface I'm going to run a function that says find all and this returns a list job and here under the live jobs implementation, I'm going to override that and I'm going to return. I'm going to use jobs database and I'm going to have values and then to list and remove the rest of the stuff. So we have jobs database values to list and this find all I'm actually going to use in the salary gap versus max function. So I'm going to say jobs find all and uh, we have a function called max by, and you can pass a lambda there. So I'm going to say it salary value. So this is the criterion by which I'm going to call max by. And then I'm going to call dot to option. And after I'm going to option, I'm going to map that option. So find all, I'm going to take parentheses. And the option I'm then going to map with it salary. So notice how easy it is to process all this data in a functional way. Now, after I have my maybe job and maybe max salary, I need to compare the two and take the difference. Now, if we were in the nullable land, we would use a let function. And in the case of option, we use flat map and map. So I'm going to simply return maybe job flat map. And we have my job in here. And I'm going to have a maybe max salary map. I'm going to have max salary and then I'm going to take the difference between these two so I'm going to have max salary value minus job salary value so this is the absolute value between of the difference between the max salary and the job id obviously this job id might not exist which is why we're going to return none in that case if that thing doesn't exist okay now we could obviously test this but it's quite straightforward to see uh, how this function works. Now, flat map and map, notice that it's very easy to get into the same kind of nested code that we used to do in the nullable uh, case with the let functions. In uh, this case, we simply replaced lets with flat map and map in case of options, which is why arrow also has one of those scopes 
that will allow us to just deal with a happy path and then leave the options to take care of the none cases automatically. Let me run an equivalent function that says salary gap versus max with one of those scopes. So I'm gonna have a function, I'm gonna call this salary, salary gap versus max. I'm going to use version two here. I'm gonna have a job ID, which is a job ID. And this is going to return an option double again. And I'm going to use a scope called option eager. Option eager will behave in a very similar way with nullable eager. And this option eager effect scope will allow us to define our options and then force them to not be none instead of nullable values and force them to not be null. Let me run a print line. I'm going to say searching for job ID and I'm going to use job ID. And then I'm going to have my job, which is a job. I'm going to use jobs find by ID job job ID and I'm going to use bind there and I'm going to use find by ID opt in the, uh, in this case so I'm going to use the optional the optional function so that I make sure that this thing is not none if this thing is none then the rest of the code is going to be interrupted and none is going to be returned by the whole expression after this case I'm sure that I'm going to have a job found. So I'm gonna have job found and I'm going to inject my job inside. Let me also run um, searching for the job with a max salary. So I'm gonna say print line uh, searching for the max salary job. I'm going to have my max salary job, which is a job and I'm going to have jobs find all and then I'm going to have my max buy, which is the same kind of code that we wrote earlier with it salary, salary, value, and then to option. And then I'm going to bind that to, so to option bind. And at this point, I'm sure that the this job also exists, which is why I'm going to have my uh, max salary job found. I'm not going to use my max salary job and then I'm going to simply take the absolute value of the difference between these ones. So I'm going to have my max salary job salary value minus job salary value. Now let me go to uh, test both of these functions just to make sure that these work in the same way. So salary gap versus max and salary gap versus max version two. And the salary max is this site reliability engineer with just two bucks above the minimum one. So I'm going to try to print line uh, testing, testing option examples. And then I'm going to have my salary diff as jobs service. We have, I think it's called salary, salary gap versus max. And I'm going to have my job ID and I'm going to try job ID number one. And this should give me back two bucks. So USD two, two dollars. And I'm going to try salary div version two. And I'm going to use the other function salary gap versus max version two with the job ID one, same two bucks. Now, let me go print these out. So I'm going to have print line salary diff version one, and I'm going to have salary diff. And this is gonna be an option, bear in mind. And I'm going to have my other print line later for salary diff version two, and I'm going to use the uh, proper variable there just to make things super clear. So salary diff version two. Let me go recompile and run this, and let's see if this thing works. All right, let's look at the logs and the logs say salary div version one is option dot sum 2.0. So we have a non empty option and the other result is salary div version two, which is again, option sum 2.0. So the result is the same, only that the second version also has these logs because we've added them explicitly. Naturally, we also have to test uh, a job ID that doesn't exist. For example, a job ID 42. And in this case, we are going to get a none. And salary gap versus max version two is going to be the most obvious here because most of these logs are not going to be triggered because the first job is not found. So the rest of the expression is stopped short. So there is going to be some short circuiting there. Let me recompile and run this and we're going to see none in both cases. All right, so we have 
salary div version one option none and salary div version two is again option none we only have one log before searching for the first job which obviously doesn't exist so there you have it folks some functional error handling in kotlin plus nullable types and option functional programming i hope you liked this video if you did go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to rock the jvm for more videos like this check me out on twitter and linkedin as i post fresh updates on upcoming material and check out my website at rock the jvm i have literally hundreds of hours of scala and kotlin and java and everything in between i'm daniel signing off